Hi guys, hope everyone is doing well and our revision sessions will keep on continuing. So I hope that we are giving you at most or the best services that we can in the time limit because like I always insist, you know, it's eight subjects or four subjects that you're writing and FR is just one among them. So the time that you allocate towards the subject has to be according to the priority. So even if you're aiming for an exemption in accounting or financial reporting, doesn't mean that you exclude the other subjects. So equal amount of weightage is necessary to be given to all the subjects. So that is the reason why we don't make sure that we extend the sessions beyond an hour or hour and a half. So within an hour and a half, our concept is to basically run you through one complete standard or a particular complex part of the standard so that you get enough clarity on what we are talking about. Now today our discussion will revolve around a very simple concept called as India S23. India S23 deals with borrowing cost. Now borrowing cost like everyone has already heard about it because A16, your earlier accounting standards was also talking about a very similar topic. And let me tell you, majority of the concepts of A16 are replicated as it is under India S23. So you won't really come across something very new, but at the same time, my a purpose of delivering the session today to you is basically to make sure that this concept you don't have to refer back to your material again. So I will make sure that at the end of the session you will definitely be able to answer each and every question related to India S23 without even referring back to your material. So this is our perspective. Now before we get into the topic one has to know what is the importance of the topic. Now someone was asking me what is the total amount of sessions that you take and what is the total number of hours that you cover in a complete session. In a complete financial reporting session, we normally cover about 130 to 140 hours or approximately about 140 hours. That is what you can take. Now someone might say, sir, uh, 140 might sound a little too low. See, understandably, you need to understand what is the weightage of each concept that we cover out here. Now look at India's 23 as such. India S23 has been one such standard which is probably just about about two and a half pages or approximately about 34 paragraphs. That's it. So very small standard. But look at the weightage as far as the examination pattern is concerned. In the last 10 attempts, you had six questions from India S23. Even more fancy of India S23 is in one particular exam, you had two questions from India S23 which were covering about 10 marks. So I am not saying that every attempt you will be getting 10 marks, but I can say that this standard has been looked at as a very important standard from the examination point of view as well. So to understand this concept in depth is what our objective being today. So today's session will be about hour and 10 minutes or hour and 15 minutes where we will be trying to cover out majority of the concepts which are discussed under India S23. I'll guarantee you that you don't have to again touch your material regarding India S23. So let's start with the session. Now India S23 like everyone knows is borrowing cost. Now I just wanted to listen from you or you just think about what could be a borrowing cost. In your language what do you understand by borrowing cost? Use the chat box. Use the chat box. What do you think is a borrowing cost? A borrowing cost means what? Is interest, okay? Interest is I think one, one particular, uh, you know, thing that pops into your head immediately when you hear about borrowing cost. Anything else other than that? Let me tell you. See, let's say I've applied for uh, whatever cost incurred. Yeah, whatever cost incurred for the borrowing, absolutely. That's exactly what I was talking about. So costs involved for the borrowing. Let's say for example, I wanted a borrowing for a project. Okay, I don't know how many of you have heard about this concept called as hydroponics. Hydroponics is a new farming concept which has emerged where pipes, uh, PVC pipes are used to basically grow farms or make sure that you are producing certain vegetables and certain crops right in your balcony of the house itself. That's a concept called as hydroponics. So a particular hydroponics person has come up to me and he said he wanted a loan for approximately about 14 crores to the extent of funding his project on hydroponics. I said fine. First thing that I'll try to do is 
let me first try to draft a project report. So a project report generally contains content like what is the depth of the industry or what could possibly be the number of customers, what could be the pricing, how much sales could actually emerge out of it. Now all these details put together and I will finally derive it saying that this company has the potential to derive certain amount of profit every year. So year on year, I'll give an estimate for at least five years trying to make sure or estimate what is the amount of profit that they're going to derive. Now this establishes, my project report establishes credibility to the project. What credibility does it give? A credibility that this project can definitely have certain repayment capacity. So a person who is borrowing the fund has a definite position to repay the funds every year on year. So whatever I do is not free of cost. Obviously, I will charge something for, uh, for uh, uh, my compensation or my professional fees for the purpose of drafting such kind of project report. So there is a particular cost involved. Number one. Number two. The banker, once I submit the project report and he start pursuing those documents, he'll first ask the customer, what is your security? So the customer basically brings his asset, uh, probably his building or per, per probably his house or a piece of land that he owns and gives it as a security. Now, at that point of time, the banker registers a mortgage or in com company law, I think you heard about this word called as charge. So a mortgage or, mortgage or a charge is registered by the banker on the property. So that property is called as collateral security. Now to register the charge, the banker incurs certain cost. Now such costs like stamp duty or whatever duties and taxes that he has to pay, he will levy it upon the uh, you know, customer again. So the banker incurs it, but at the same time, he will collect it back from the customer. Now all this is also a cost in the hands of the borrower. Therefore, you can understand there are so many costs which are associated to arrangement of the borrowing. So the cost associated to arrangement of the borrowing is also a borrowing cost. So not just interest, but also even these kind of costs which are incidental to arrangement of a borrowing should also be considered as borrowing cost. Going into the next one. There is a certain kind of debentures which are issued. I hope everyone knows that debenture is a long term source of debt. A long term debt like a debenture, if it is issued at a discount or if it is redeemed at a premium, that means a 100 rupee debenture, which I'll repay at 100 rupees on the maturity day. Today, I'm issuing it to you only at 95 rupees. Or I'm saying you subscribe to a debenture today at 100 rupees. I'll give you 110 rupees on the date of maturity. So those kind of amounts which I pay in excess, I paid in excess. So such amount which I paid in excess is also a cost to the borrower because I am paying more than what I'm supposed to pay. So premium on redemption of debentures or discount on issue of debentures in the debenture redemption topic, you call it as loss on issue of debentures is also a cost which is incidental to the borrowing. That is number three. Number four is what you will come across when you deal with leases called as finance charges under lease. Finance charge is also an interest I am not going to touch about that concept when I am discussing in days 23. For you to have a better understanding of what is a finance charge, it is better you touch the concept of leases. But number four is your finance charges under finance lease. Number five, last one is called as exchange differences. To an extent, they can be regarded as borrowing cost. So what did I say? I said exchange differences to an extent they can be regarded as borrowing cost. Now the question comes up, what exchange differences can be regarded as borrowing cost? And next thing, next question among that will be to an extent, to what extent? To what extent should I assume that an exchange loss is a borrowing cost? So therefore, it is very important for us to understand in depth the fifth point. So I can say borrowing cost is nothing but interest and other commitment charges. Cost incidental to arrangement of borrowing, premium on redemption of debentures or discount on issue of debentures and bonds. Number four is your finance charges under finance lease. Number five 
is your exchange differences to an extent they can be regarded as borrowing cost. But this definition was what was given under A16. When we came up to India's 23, there was a slight change in the definition. What is the slight change in the definition? The slight change in the definition that they have done is that they have combined the three things. Just a second. That they have combined the first three points. That is interest and other commitment charges, amortization and cost incidental to arrangement of borrowing, amortization of discount on issue and premium on redemption of debt. All these three combined, they have given one specific name to that called as effective interest rate. The term which is used there is effective interest rate. Point number four and five stays as it is. But this word effective interest rate has come out of nowhere. So let's exactly understand what this effective interest rate is. Well, I am trying to emphasize on this concept called as effective interest rate. Effective interest rate, for you to simply understand this concept, this is nothing but your IRR. If you know what is the IRR formula, then you are definitely going to get what is effective interest. Let's say for example, an enterprise borrowed the amount of borrowing was about to keep it simple, 1000 rupees. It was repayable within a span of 5 years. It carried an interest of let's say 10% per annum. But there was a processing charges which were levied by the banker. to an extent of let's say 2% of the borrowing. Now my intention is to identify what is the effective interest rate because this processing charges are no longer included in the definition because the definition today now it reads as effective interest rate. Now over 5 years my intention is to repay 1000 rupees of borrowing. So 1000 rupees of borrowing to be repaid over 5 years. Each year I will repay 200 rupees of borrowing. Yes, so 200 rupees of borrowing as a principal amount along with the interest. So give me the cash flows which I am going to get. Here and cash flows. Pick up the mark. Here 0, 1, 2, 3, 4 and 5. These 5 years, look at my cash flows out here. My first cash flow is going to be a negative or okay, positive year 0. I am borrowing. How much did you borrow? I borrowed 1000 rupees. But on this 1000 rupees, I had a processing charges of 2% which were levied. Therefore, how much amount did it credit into my bank account? Only 980 rupees got credited into my bank account. Only 980 got credited because 2% was deducted as borrowing cost or processing charges. So it's a positive cash flow because it's a cash inflow. Every year I'm repaying 200 along with an interest on 1000 for the first year. So 10% interest on 1000 is how much? 100 plus what is the principal repayment every year? 200. So my negative cash flow the first year is 300. My loan outstanding has now become only 800. On 800 again 10% is 80 plus a principal repayment of 200. I will get it as 280. Third year the amount outstanding is 600. 10% is 60 plus a principal repayment of 200. This is 260. Observe the trend, each year it is reducing by 
20 each, 240 and 220. There is one positive cash flow and a series of negative cash flows. Ultimately, I'm saying at the end, this becomes zero. There is no longer any, any repayment at the end of, after the end of fifth year. Now, if I try to basically equate this and try to identify what is the IRR, this IRR will be my effective interest rate. Remember this word of effective interest rate because this will emerge even under India's 109 when I talk about financial instruments. Under financial instruments also we get this concept of effective interest rate when we talk about a particular financial asset being recognized. So remember this topic but this is particularly effective interest rate but in general sense instead of this 980 if this was 1000 it would have been 10 percent. IRR would have been 10 percent but it is not 1000 it is 980 therefore the rate would generally be greater than 10 percent. Something about 10.4 or 10.5 percent is what you would get and that 10.4 or 10.5 is generally called as your effective interest rate. So what is happening? Your interest rate is being escalated or increased to a certain extent so as to make sure that your amount of 20 rupees which got deducted at the beginning which is also a cost incidental to the borrowing is spread over those five years period. Over the entire five years period the amount of interest or that extra 20 rupees will get allocated. That is the concept behind effective interest rate. Now someone will ask me a question what would you do earlier under AS 16 then what do I do? 20 rupees got deducted. 5 years is a least a loan term. So over 5 years I will amortize this 20 rupees to PN. So what is great difference that is happening here? Even there also it was going into PNL. Now also it is going into PNL. It is just the rate at which it was going to PNL. If I would give you a simple thought, 20 rupees under A16 would have been amortized to PNL probably on a straight line basis, charging 4 rupees per annum. But now what happens? When you are charging it as an interest, Higher amount will get allocated in the first year when the loan outstanding is maximum. As the loan outstanding comes lower and lower and lower towards the end, automatically the amount of uh, interest also reduces. Even the allocation of those 20 rupees also reduces. So instead of going by a straight line basis, I'm going by a more, you know, quantifiably a logical way of transferring this amount. So this is my concept of effective interest rate. So effective interest rate is what we have discussed here under the definition and it is one of the most important concepts. I know the other important concept will be this concept of exchange differences to an extent they can be regarded as borrowing cost. Everyone is eager to know what exactly that is. I will come back to that but I want you people to understand what is effective interest rate in complete sense. So anything that you have, you can please ask your questions.
Now look back at the last point. Exchange difference. To an extent, they can be regarded as borrowing cost. What exactly do you mean by that? Exchange differences to an extent, they are regarded as borrowing cost. Now why does an exchange rate? Exchange differences are dealt as per India's 21 already. Why India's 23 has to come again in particular and talk about exchange differences being regarded as borrowing cost. Let's try to concentrate on this point because this point is really tricky and really interesting. Like I said, it is very tricky at the same time, very interesting. Okay. Let us assume, okay. Let us assume that a company is looking to borrow My company is expecting to borrow about rupee lakh. One lakh rupee is what I'm expecting to borrow. I am looking at the interest rates which are prevailing at that particular point of time. And considering the bank interest rate, I said the rate of interest is 12%. Therefore, I said fine. That means my interest cost for borrowing 1 lakh at 12% would amount to about 12,000 rupees per annum. Agree? Immediately, a finance guy has come up to me and he said, Sir, all this is if you are borrowing in rupee terms. Sir, I suggest you to instead go and borrow in dollars. I asked him a reason why should I borrow in dollars. He said, sir, the borrowing rate in dollar is only 5%. So you are getting a cheaper borrowing in dollars. So why don't you borrow in dollars? I said, fine. How much should I borrow? He said, sir, you need lakh rupee, right? On today's day, the exchange rates, the exchange rates on today day, today's day is, let's say, 50 rupees per dollar. So therefore, I suggest you to borrow only $2,000. Borrow 2000 convert it into rupee at 50 rupees, get your 1 lakh back. That's fantastic. He said, sir, if you do this approach, then instead of paying 12,000 rupees per annum, you will only be paying $100 as interest at the end of the year. On that day, interest rate parity theorem, I don't know if you remember this story in uh, SFM. Lower interest rate, the, the value of, a, of the currency normally appreciates. So let's say it has become 53 rupee per dollar. Okay. Then he said, sir, no problem, sir, even if dollar appreciates, look at the concept out here. He said, sir, even if the dollar appreciates at, at 53 rupees per dollar, you are still paying only $100. Therefore, you will only end up paying 5,300 in, in rupee terms. In comparison with 12,000 rupee per annum, have you borrowed in rupee terms? Therefore, you derive, comparing these two, I derive an interest savings saving in interest cost of about 6,700. I got a savings of about 6,700. said, wow, I saved so much on interest. Fantastic. So let's go with the concept of borrowing in dollars. Why should I borrow in rupee since it is giving me a good interest saving? Immediately at that point of time, fix in your India 21. Your India 21 says, sir, you are borrowing in dollar on today's date. You are only borrowing $2,000. I agree. But look at your exchange rate, which has increased. 
So tomorrow when you have to repay, your liability of $2,000 is not one lakh anymore. Your liability of $2,000 today, at today's rate of 53 rupees per dollar, instead of being one lakh, has become one lakh six thousand. So there is an exchange loss. There is an exchange loss on borrowing. If you would have borrowed in dollars, you would have incurred an exchange loss. How much is the loss? I borrowed $2,000. Dollar rate became 53 from 50. So I lost about 3 rupees per dollar. Therefore, my exchange loss today is about 6,000 rupees. So he says, According to India's 23, lower of these two figures, lower of savings and interest cost or the exchange loss on borrowing, lower of the above shall be considered as Borrowing cost as per in days 23. Lower of the exchange loss arising on the foreign currency borrowing because of the increase in the value of dollar or the savings in interest cost because of the lower interest rate on a dollar borrowing. If I compare these two, lower of these two amounts shall be considered as borrowing cost. So the question comes up, there is a 6,000 rupee of exchange loss, correct? My exchange loss is 6,000 rupee. This 6,000 rupee is no longer dealt under India's 21. So not under India's 21, but now it will be governed as per India's 23. The exchange loss will be governed as per India's 23. This is the concept of exchange loss. To an extent, they can be considered as borrowing cost. The entire exchange loss you treated as borrowing cost and you are saying to an extent. Wait a second. Assume, assume, instead of this 53 rupees per dollar, assume that this was Let's say 55 rupees per dollar. Then what would be the amount? Then the interest would have been 5,500. Savings in interest cost would have been compared to 12,000. 6,500. Exchange loss instead of 53, this would have become 55. Therefore, 5 rupees of loss in dollar per dollar of 2,000. So the exchange loss would have been 10,000. Lower of these two, how much should be treated as borrowing cost? The amount to be considered as borrowing cost is only 6,005. How much is the exchange loss? The exchange loss is not 6,000 now. The exchange loss would have been 10,000 now. Out of 10,000, I'll split it into two parts and I'll say to the extent of the 10,000, how much is considered as borrowing cost? 6,500 is considered as borrowing cost while the balance 3,500 is exchange loss which should be governed as per in days 21 and to the extent of 6,500 it will be governed as per in days 23 as borrowing cost. That's why I said exchange loss to an extent it can be regarded as borrowing cost. I have given you a similar example here, out here. You can, even if you haven't copied it down, no problem because the similar example is already there. Right here. 
So I've given the same thing. Rupee equivalent borrowing of 1 lakh, 5%. I just took the exchange rate as 55 and the value is 5,500 in rupee terms and the saving is 6,500. Exchange loss is 10,000. Therefore, I have a lower of those both 6,500 to be considered as borrowing cost. So out of 10,000, 6,500 is treated as borrowing cost under India S23, while that balance amount of exchange loss of 3,500 should be treated as per India S21. So this is a fundamental concept of exchange loss to an extent they can be regarded as borrowing cost. Well, after a good 35 minutes of the standards understanding, let me tell you one thing that we haven't even progressed in, progressed in understanding the standard first of all. Because first of all, the question would be, why should I learn about the standard? Why should India 23 be learned first of all? Borrowing cost, I've incurred a borrowing cost, you throw it into the p and as good as that. Absolutely no. That is where the significance of the standard comes in. Actually, the heading of the standard shouldn't have been borrowing cost, but should have been borrowing cost on qualifying asset. Because the standard is basically coming out with an objective. The objective of the standard is to capitalize borrowing cost on qualifying asset. That means if I have taken a borrowing or I have utilized a borrowing for the purpose of a particular asset, then the amount of cost, instead of transferring it to p &L, you add it to the cost of the asset. What happened? The cost of the asset increased. 
what happens if you increase the cost of the asset? Depreciation will go up in the subsequent period. Over the life of the asset, you keep charging the amount as depreciation into the PNL. Ultimately, it goes into the PNL, but the only thing is, instead of going into the PNL in the year in which you have incurred the borrowing cost, it will go into the PNL over the lifetime of the asset. That is the only significant difference, and that is the only objective of bringing up the discussion regarding India S23. So, what does the standard say? The standard says borrowing costs on a qualifying asset is eligible to be capitalized to the cost of the asset. It is eligible to be capitalized to the cost of the asset, while any other borrowing cost should be charged off to PNL. Now, question arises: What is a qualifying asset? In simple sense, a qualifying asset. In simple sense, a qualifying asset is an asset which necessarily takes an asset which necessarily takes substantial period of time. Sorry, guys, I haven't got the definition here. So please make sure that you are noting down the definition, or you go through the definition somewhere. An asset which necessarily takes a substantial time to get ready for its intended use or sale. Asset. It is an asset which necessarily takes substantial period of time to get ready for its intended use or sale. Question comes up. First of all, I am trying to understand this definition of qualifying asset. Now you are bringing up a new word called a substantial period of time. What is substantial period? Substantial. What is substantial? Let's say for example, uh, I purchased a mobile phone, like an iPhone, for 1 lakh rupees. Substantial. Substantial amount of expenditure being spent on a mobile phone. I bought a mobile phone, I bought a mobile phone of any other company for 20,000 rupees. Not substantial. Because mobile phones around 20,000 rupees is absolutely fine. So what is happening out here? Substantial, it depicts. Because probably for someone in the, in the stature of earning about a crore per annum, for him a mobile phone spending, uh, expending about 1 lakh rupee might be very normal. But for you and me, it could be quite substantial. From a CA student's perspective, 6 months is substantial. In 6 months time, my life changes. I pass life changes. I am a qualified chartered account. A certificate in my hand, whatever I do after that, my will, my wish. My wish. Ah, I want to do my own practice. I want to go into a job. Or I want to take a sabbatical. I don't want to work anywhere. I will go around the world for about, you know, an year or two years. Absolutely your wish. Absolutely your wish. So six months can change the fate of your life. Fail. Ah, I don't want to talk about it. But imagine a fail. Imagine a fail. It's a significant shift. Your friends change, right? A person who already passed out, no longer a friend. No longer a friend, man. The real friend, the blood friend is the fellow who failed along with you. The connection that you have between two people who failed the similar exam and the person who actually passed an exam and failed an exam, not the same. Once two friends are not really friends, two acquaintances fail together, they become thick friends. So your friends changed. No, the, the environment around your family changed because immediately someone walks into the house and asks me, what are you doing? I'm writing my chartered account. It's last time you've given your exam. Okay. The mood changes. The mood changes. I haven't cleared my exam last time. This is how you, how could you not clear? There is one guy, he was absolute rogue right next to my uh, door, my neighbor. His son cleared. And how could you not clear now these sentences? are hurting man, emotionally they hurt. So six months made a lot of difference. Imagine the same person walking out your door and asking you, what are you doing? I say, I qualified my CA. I passed out my exam. Imagine the confidence that you are gonna have in approaching that conversation. But that's exactly my point. So six months is substantial period of time for a child account. Become guy, six months, not substantial. Not substantial until three years. Anyways, I'm not going to get my degree. What great difference does it make? 
if i clear all the exams at the end of the third year also absolutely acceptable we take the fourth four years substantial within four years all backlogs if i clear that is more than sufficient i have no interest in clearing the exams during the between itself i could be absent for the exams or i might not even go and write the exam as well so substantial period of time between the person of the same age group is differing from person to person so the word substantial period is so loosely termed so loose so loose that today people can interpret that word substantial period by however they want there has to be some concrete thing unfortunately indias does not give you any such kind of substance nowhere under indias 23 substantial period of time has been defined a 16 did it define substantial period of time no again no it was accounting standard interpretation 1 asi 1 which came out and said substantial period of time can be considered as 12 months anything less than 12 months cannot be considered as substantial unless and until the enterprise can prove the enterprise can prove with facts that yes any period less than 12 months is also substantial but a period greater than 12 months is always considered as substantial period of time as per accounting standard interpretation 1 now the word they use under accounting standard interpretation is called as substantial period is rebuttably assumed rebuttable assumption is greater than 1 year or greater than 12 months so any period shorter than 12 months cannot be considered as substantial period unless there is sufficient facts of the case i am not ruling out but i am saying if there are sufficient facts of the case a period less than 12 months can also be considered as substantial period of time so an asset which necessarily takes substantial period of time to get ready for its intended use or sale either i have an intention to use the asset or i have an intention to sell the asset they can be qualifying asset intention to use the asset could be property plan and equipment could be intangible asset could be investment property intention to sell the asset inventory inventory is an asset which is intended for sale so a qualifying asset to which borrowing cost can be capitalized can either be a property plan and equipment could be an intangible asset could be an investment corp property also can be an inventory as well now let's say i've got an order the order from the customer was about 5000 units to be produced and is then this order can be accomplished in parts over 3 years period over 3 years 5000 units 3 years immediately substantial period yes or no but 5000 units should i consider this particular inventory being produced in my factory as a qualifying asset or no answer is absolutely no because it is a specific exclusion given under india's 23 india's 23 says inventory produced in large quantities on a similar repetitive production cycle 5000 units similar production cycle repetitive basis you are continuing to do it just because the order quantity is large it is taking 3 years you cannot consider it as substantial period one particular item of an inventory if it is taking more than 12 months to produce then it is substantial period i am a real estate developer i construct high rise buildings and i sell the time for my construction is 24 months 2 years my units of a uh, flats for sale are inventory it takes substantial period of time to complete therefore can be considered as a qualifying asset borrowing cost incurred during this period is eligible to be capitalized to the cost of the asset clear one more exclusion the asset itself was recognized at fair value the asset itself was measured at fair value we have a lot of aspects under india 16 india 38 we have seen 
where the measurement of the asset happened at fair value. If the asset itself is measured at fair value, then borrowing cost should not be capitalized. Why? When the asset is measured at fair value, if you capitalize borrowing cost, then the cost of the asset will be fair value plus borrowing cost. You cannot recognize an asset more than its fair value. Therefore, such items cannot be recognized. An asset which is initially recognized at fair value, borrowing cost is not eligible to be capitalized. So two aspects where I told you borrowing cost is not eligible to be capitalized. One, where inventory is produced in large quantities which are going through a similar production cycles on a repetitive basis. In your borrowing cost is not eligible to be capitalized even though it takes substantial period to complete the production. Number two, an asset which was measured at its fair value on initial recognition itself it was at fair value. Therefore, there is no point of identifying or capitalizing borrowing cost to it. These are the two specific exclusion for assets on which borrowing cost is not eligible to be capitalized. So my intention is borrowing cost objective of India's 23 is to allow capitalization of borrowing cost on a qualifying asset. What is a qualifying asset? An asset which necessarily takes substantial period of time to get ready for its intended use or sale. But however, the word substantial period is not defined under India's 23. So logically, I have taken interpretation from accounting standard interpretation 1, which says substantial period of time is any period greater than 12 months. However, a period shorter than 12 months can also be considered a substantial period if there are sufficient facts of the case. Any doubts, please let me know. Now look at this concept of capitalization of borrowing cost. What is the borrowing cost which is eligible to be capitalized to the qualifying asset? We have discussed about what is the qualifying asset. So let us say there was a qualifying asset. Now the enterprise is looking at how much amount of borrowing cost should I capitalize to the asset. To understand this concept, I will identify the borrowings into two types. Specific borrowing, non-specific borrowing. Non-specific borrowing, you can also call it as general borrowing. But what do you mean by specific borrowing? Name itself is so easy to understand, right? That is the name specific. What do you mean? Such borrowing which has been considered or which has been taken only for the purpose of this qualifying asset is considered as specific borrowing. I am constructing a particular premises. 10 floor building I am constructing for the purpose of this 10 floor building. I have submitted the project cost to SBI bank. SBI has lent me 
10 crore rupees for the construction specifically for the purpose of construction therefore it is a specific bond so easy right look at how the standard terms it okay now i'll give you the wordings in the standard and look at how tricky the sounding is a borrowing which would have been avoided listen to the wordings very carefully a borrowing which would have been avoided the construction of qualifying asset been not taken up a borrowing which would have been avoided construction of the qualifying asset not been taken up means what i wouldn't have taken the borrowing had not been this construction of qualifying asset if this borrowing if this qualifying asset was not there i wouldn't have taken this borrowing that is specific borrowing so two exclusive statements he made two negative statements i would have avoided this borrowing had there not been this qualifying asset or in the, instead i can put them into positive tense i would I have taken this borrowing only for the purpose of funding this qualifying asset either way you can understand but as such the terminology of the standard sometimes is actually very tricky got it so specific borrowing what is a general borrowing or a non specific borrowing any normal borrowing i have taken an overdraft overdraft for my business purpose a part of this overdraft has been consumed for the construction of qualifying asset i have utilized this borrowing uh, overdraft in part for the construction of the qualifying asset general borrowing i have taken the overdraft for my business i never said i have taken it only for this particular qualifying asset so that is fundamentally what is a general borrowing so what is the borrowing cost eligible to be capitalized the borrowing cost eligible to be capitalized for a specific borrowing is the actual borrowing cost reduced by any savings on idle funds any savings on idle funds i have taken about 10 crore of funding immediately 10 crore got credited into my account for the next one year my expenditure on the qualifying asset is only 4 crores what should i do with the balance 6 crores i parked it somewhere in an investment so that i could get some return on that so the actual borrowing cost incurred is on the entire 10 crores which should be reduced by the return which i am deriving on those idle funds clear on non specific or general borrowing i can't take actual borrowing cost because the entire general borrowing may not be utilized only for the construction of qualifying asset therefore he says the amount utilized out of the non specific borrowing multiplied by capitalization rate multiplied by capitalization rate what is this capitalization rate capitalization rate is nothing but weighted average rate of interest on all non specific borrowings or general borrowings there are multiple non specific borrowings in my company for the purpose of the qualifying asset i have utilized a borrowing out of each one of them then i will consider weighted average interest cost if there is only one general borrowing then no weighted average only that interest will be considered so this capitalization rate is a weighted average rate how do you get weighted average rate it is interest or borrowing cost on non specific borrowing divided by total non specific borrowings into 100 is my capitalization rate so i'm saying once you have identified that there is a qualifying asset to which borrowing cost should be capitalized then how much of the borrowing cost should be capitalized to identify the amount of borrowing cost eligible to be capitalized i will split the borrowing into two types on specific borrowings i will take actual borrowing cost reduced by savings on idle funds number 2 on non specific borrowings or general borrowings i will take amount utilized towards qualifying asset multiplied by capitalization rate what is capitalization rate weighted average rate of interest on all non specific borrowings in the enterprise clear get the logic go ahead any doubts keep posting
Guys, I'll just give you an example of how do I calculate this capitalization rate, okay? Let's say for example, the enterprise has a term loan. The enterprise has a bank OD. The bank also, uh, enterprise also has a cash credit. ODs and cash credits are particularly the same thing guys. They're used for a different purpose, that's it. Let's say the amount and rate of interest have been given. All are general borrowings, okay? Everything is general borrowing. There is no specific borrowing in this. Uh, this is about 10 lakhs. This is about 6 lakhs. About 4 lakhs. Ease of calculation, I have taken total of 20 lakhs. My rate of interest, let's say it was 10%. OD was carrying 12%. Cash credit was carrying, let's say 13%. Then what is your interest? Can you give me the interest? 1 lakh, right? And this would be 72,000. And this would be, last one would be 52,000. Makes it a total of 2 lakh 24,000. What is the borrowing amount? 20 lakhs. So, what is your capitalization rate? Capitalization rate is equal to 2 lakh 24,000 divided by 20 lakhs. Which will be 10.12 or 11 point, I guess. Sorry. Into 100. Forgot this. So it will be 11.2. 11.2% is my capitalization rate. Let's say I have an asset. The asset was valued at let's say about 10 lakhs. This is the cost. Out of the cost of this asset of 10 lakhs, let's say my specific borrowing and general borrowing utilized. Let's say my specific borrowing was 5 lakhs, which had an interest rate of 10%. Right? My general borrowing was obviously the balance 5 lakhs, which had a capitalization rate of 11.2%. Now calculate. Amount eligible to be capitalized is 50,000. 55,100. Therefore, the total amount of borrowing cost which is eligible to be capitalized, combination of both, 1,5100 is the total borrowing cost eligible to be capitalized on the cost of the asset. So now what is your cost of the asset? My cost of the asset was actually 10 lakhs plus the borrowing cost eligible to be capitalized is 1,5000. Therefore, the Total cost of the asset will become 11 lakh 5000. That will become the, oh sorry, 5100, right? 11 lakh 5100 will be the capitalized cost of the asset. This will be my cost of asset. So instead of charging a depreciation, let's say the depreciation is 20%. Instead of charging 2 lakhs on 10 lakhs, I will start charging 2 lakh 20,000 or something as your depreciation. The increased cost is because of the excess borrowing cost. Clear? 
I hope I was very clear as far as explaining this concept of your borrowing cost is concerned. Now let's move into the next concept. These are the three concepts before I end the standard. When should I start capitalizing? When should I stop capitalizing? When do I suspend capitalizing? Stop and suspend are two different things. Okay. Suspension is a temporary pause. Pause. Again, it will receive. Pause. Stop means complete full stop. Cessation. The capitalization of borrowing cost will cease. Over. After that, no further capitalization. First, let me concentrate about commencement. When do I start? I will start capitalizing of borrowing cost when first one. Borrowing cost is incurred. Without the borrowing cost being incurred, how will you capitalize it? Number two, cost on the qualifying asset is incurred. Let's say I have taken a borrowing on 1st April month. For the first three months, I did not do anything. After 1st July, I started the commencement of qualifying asset. First three months, you still incurred borrowing cost? Yes. Is it eligible to be capitalized? No. Because you did not incur any cost on the qualifying asset. So cost on the qualifying asset should be incurred. Number three, activity necessary for the commencement of uh, for the construction of the qualifying asset is in progress. I have given an advance to my supplier. The supplier said he will give the material in 15 days. After 15 days, once the material arrives, I will, con I will start the construction of qualifying asset. So when you gave the advance, can I start capitalizing? No, because let the material reach me. And once I start using the material for construction of qualifying asset, that is when I will start capitalizing. So all three conditions put together should be satisfied. What are the three conditions? First one, borrowing cost should be incurred. Number two, cost should be incurred on the qualifying asset. Number three, activities necessary for the construction of qualifying asset are in progress. If all these three conditions are satisfied, then the borrowing cost is eligible to be capitalized. Clear? Now, let's say I have taken a borrowing. Borrowing cost has been incurred from the beginning itself. Okay. However, for the first two months, I only spent in making designs or planning for the construction. I went to an architect. I told him that this is my piece of land and I wanted a drawing. I sat with him and I started making sure that the drawing is according to what I want. There is nothing which got material on the site. It is still in the drawing phase. Can this planning phase be considered as activity necessary for the construction of qualifying asset? Answer is yes. Activities like designing and planning are an integral part and are necessary for the construction of qualifying asset. Therefore, even during these phases of designing and planning, the construction of qualifying asset can commence or the borrowing cost, the commencement of sorry, the capitalization of borrowing cost can commence. Clear? Second concept. Stop. When do I stop capitalizing? My capitalization of borrowing cost on the qualifying asset should cease, should full stop, should end. When the asset is substantially ready, when the asset is substantially ready for intended user sale. When the asset is substantially ready for its intended user sale, I will end, I will stop capitalization of borrowing cost. Clear? Now, when, what do you mean by substantially ready? Almost ready. Almost ready. It need not be completely ready. Everything is completed, sir. Inauguration is pending. Substantially ready. Everything is completed. Everything is in proper order, sir. Only thing which is pending out there is making sure that the windows are fixed. The windows will be fixed in next week. Substantially ready. You can stop. So substantially ready is again a matter of judgment. 
where do I stop capitalizing? Okay, but it is substantially ready, is sufficient for you to stop capitalizing. You don't have to wait until the entire process is complete. Let me give you a practical example. Let's say I'm constructing a building which is intended for sale. Okay, fine. Construction has commenced, almost completed. Buyer is not coming to me. What I did was, I did not fit the doors. Every day, I asked the contractor, you go inside, fit one screw in the each door and come back. Like that, you keep doing. After two months or three months, I found a buyer. I fit all the screws on one day and I came out. I did that because I did not want to stop capitalizing of borrowing costs. It is not possible to stop these kind of approaches itself. We use the word, the asset is substantially ready. You can stop capitalizing of borrowing cost. Clear? What is suspension? What do you mean by suspension? Suspension means temporary pause. Why do I temporarily pause? I put it like this. I will temporarily stop capitalization of borrowing cost when it's your active development of the asset. Active development of what asset? Qualifying asset. Your active development of qualifying asset is interrupted for an extended period of time. When the active development of qualifying asset is interrupted for an extended period of time. What do you mean by that? Sir, I work only five days a week. The enterprise is only functioning for five days a week. So what happened was, on Saturdays and Sundays, I don't do any active development on the construction of qualifying asset. In the year, there are 52 weeks, 104 weekends, Saturdays and Sundays. Apart from that, Gandhi Jayanti, your Independence Day, 120 days out of total 365 days, I haven't done any active development. So therefore, for this 120 days, I will not capitalize borrowing cost. Wrong. Because he said, active development is interrupted over extended period of time. What is extended period means? Beyond normal length. Four days, Diwali holidays, not extended period. Abnormal period. The COVID crisis extended period there is a strike in the factory extended period there is a natural calamity which occurred extended period i stopped the cap uh, you know i stopped the active development these can be taken as the examples for when the capitalization of the borrowing cost can be suspended three topics that we have discussed when to start when to stop when to pause commencement Cessation, suspension of capitalization. Clear? That will bring us to the end of discussion on your India's 23.